Six weeks after the baby, I was back doing trade shows and breastfeeding behind trade show booths. Anaji Mum has created a product that's gone global. When I started at the weekend markets in my B-Dub Beetle, setting up my trestle table, we were making about 20k a month in cash. Just from markets, that's it, get rid of the job, all in on the business. Well, if it works in Australia, it has to work in America. So I did my very first trade show overseas. I turned up with my six-month-old baby, 10 suitcases of stock. We didn't know anyone in America. <laughs> Within six months of doing that trade show, I had full distribution in the US and Canada and did sales that year and within three years generated over. Wow. Wow. It blows my mind that literally you're shuffling through products at the back of a Korean supermarket in Sydney. Four or five years later, you're sitting in an M&A firm looking at selling this thing for 10 times its earnings. So this is the big thing everyone's going, but what does she sell, <laughs> yeah. right? So what do you sell? What's up guys, in today's episode, you are in for a massive treat. We had Jelaine D on the show that you are about to see. This young entrepreneur from Brisbane, Australia has absolutely crushed it. She started a mascara business uh, that blew up both here in Australia and in the United States. She got into over 50 states across the US, Bloomingdale, some huge retailers, her story is incredible. She started in the markets. She scaled the business for five years, started literally with a product that she found in the back of a Korean supermarket in Sydney, and five years later, sold it out at 10 times earning to a private equity group. If you stay to the end, I promise you, it is worth every single second in this particular episode. You're gonna learn exactly how she did it step by step. We unpack it all, strap your seatbelt on, get your pen at the ready and enjoy. Now, something that we're doing that we have not done before is we are gonna give away a free iPad to somebody who watches this episode. There's only two things Things you need to do to go in the drawer. Number one, you need to drop a comment below. So drop a comment about the show below. And number two, you need to subscribe to the channel. So go ahead, hit that subscribe button, drop us a comment about the show, and then we are going to draw from the comments below in an upcoming show the winner from a live comment that comes in on this podcast on YouTube. So thanks for watching. Enjoy the show and we'll see you soon. What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Unemployable, Australia's fastest growing podcast in the business space. As always, completely unverified. We are self-promoting, <laughs> self-proclaiming the usual deal. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here. And uh, thank you for all the wonderful comments that we've been getting in the YouTube comments section. Uh, it is so helpful to us guys to uh, hear that you guys are watching, knowing what's landing for you. And partly today's pod is a result of you guys telling us what you want more of. And we have a lovely person here who is a female entrepreneur in the podcast today. Uh, we had so much positive feedback. So Jelaine, thank you for coming in and sharing your amazing story today. How are you feeling? Amazing. I amazing. love this. Nothing more that I'd rather be doing right now. Hey. <laughs> That's great. It's nice to have a little bit of female vibe in here. It's usually just blokes, you know, shit talking. <laughs> but it, we've got a bit of a female class here with us today. Day, which is going to be great can't wait to dive in the story mark how are you buddy yeah doing good good to be back up again yeah back up from melbourne yes. you're, you're going to be up here soon full time right i reckon soon we're getting close getting we're getting close. close you were down at the uh, grand prix just recently as well yeah that was awesome how was there the for race? three days did yeah. a lot of walking yeah. this, the track is so big you don't realize how much walking you actually do when you're at the event um but it was good no it was great the race was good was, I was um, fanboying big time seeing you. Yeah, so, so was I. I was like, you know, waiting in the areas where all the drivers um, walk past and things like that, just see who I could uh, catch a glimpse of. But yeah, I was, I was a big fanboy too. Yeah, you got Lewis Hamilton and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, rocks so up jealous. in his, uh, his catwalk outfit and gets the buggy to go from here to there. It was just, yeah, it's pretty Rockstar. funny. They're, they're celebrities now. They're full on celebrities. Proper, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 A bit like this guy, Eric, everybody. <laughs> Speaking of celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> in your own I'm, mind. Yeah. When are we operating uh, I'm good. security? Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I'm, uh, I'm very good. I'm excited. I was, uh, I got uh, to speak um, with Jelaine at an event um, 
uh, the same event you were speaking at a couple of weeks ago. So I got to speak right after her. So I had big shoes to fill because wow. <laughs> she had an amazing, desperate. amazing presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she, she had an amazing presentation. So I'm excited to yeah unpack this. And yeah, we heard that actually. We got a lot of people from your talk, Jelaine, were saying, you've got to have this girl on the pod. So <laughs> um, uh, I wish I'd stayed for it, but it was my birthday on that day, my 50th birthday. But we had lots of people say you were fantastic. And for those watching, this is going to be really awesome because... Jelaine's not only had a great success story, but um, I think it's a success story that holds a lot of lessons and opportunities for our audience. So if you sell any kind of physical product, um, uh, you're gonna love this one because Jelaine is a guru in this area of um, something that we don't talk about very often, which is retail distribution. Mm -hmm. And her own products were sold into Nordstrom's and David Jones and all these massive retailers. And today, she helps entrepreneurs get into these massive retailers, I assume in Australia, but definitely Globally. in the US. Globally. Yeah. US as well. And so this is going to be super exciting. Not only has she done it herself, but she scaled her business and sold it to private equity. So we're going to get into that in just a moment. And it's going to be a, a ripping podcast. But uh, as always, just want to thank our sponsors for today, Early Bird AI, you know, the only company that will sponsor us at the moment um, because they're our company. <laughs> We're still too small and illegitimate. But um, these are the guys, earlybird.ai. If you have a business of any kind that has a website or is trying to generate more leads or cr create efficiencies, uh, Early Bird AI are the guys to go to. Essentially, in a nutshell, uh, these guys will do a free audit of your business and show you how to actually implement AI. But more than just show you, they don't run courses, so to speak. They actually build AI for your business, set it all up, show you how to drive it, and we'll even manage it for you. We're using it in dry flush toilets. Just yesterday, I was in there having my meeting with all the ways they're implementing AI from doing outbound phone calls, which sound exactly like real Australian people with the pauses and the breaths and that it's indiscernible it's absolutely crazy calling to see if the toilets arrived okay if they need anything um, and also uh, automation on our website not like just a chatbot but a chatbot that knows absolutely everything about our product collects their name collects their email starts texting them on on their phones it does some amazing stuff and it works 24 7 so uh, the applications are amazing if you sell physical products it does some incredible stuff for you uh, the tools that they're using so uh, rather than take up all the time in the pod just go to early bird which is e-a-r-l-i rather than why early bird Dot AI and the guys will do a free audit for you and show you exactly what they can do for you and uh, check it out really really cool what they're doing there and they've only been going for a month nearly and they have just been smashed and <laughs> the only advertising they're doing is on the pod which is amazing um, so check them out really really good dudes so with that all said this is quite a story Jelaine um, <laughs> we were checking you out online and You've got some amazing publicity, right? You've been in the BRW Fast 100, the Sydney Morning Herald, the Daily Telegraph, the Daily Mail, the Australian Financial Review. Um, you've been a Telstra Businesswoman Award winner. Um, like your accolades are just like really deep and um, that doesn't come easily. That, you know, you've got to have actually got receipts to get that level of exposure. Um, and for those of you who want to learn more about Jelaine, go to mogulmethods.com.au. Okay, .com.au. And you can read more about uh, your story. But at a high level, uh, in a few sentences, how would you describe the very, you know, just big chunks of your story? Like you started here, mm. you, you scaled to here, you sold here, and now you do this. Yeah. What would be that very brief soundbite? Yeah, I think I, I had a quarter life crisis in my mid 20s and realized corporate was not for me and I did all the right things and, you know, climbed my way and hated it. I was planning my escape every chance I could and just wanted freedom. Like most people in business wanted freedom. I had a lot of debt as a 20 something year old, typical Gen Y, just maxed out credit, credit card debts. And I thought, well, I'm not going to pay this off working this corporate job I've got to start a business and um, I actually wrote on a post-it note in my goals that I'm going to win a Telstra business award before I even had a business I was that sure that I was going to make it happen like whatever it took and just went on that journey of like learning everything books audios workshops who you know anyone who was coming into Australia to talk about marketing sales business I was there and I just implemented it, you know, when I started at the weekend markets in Brisbane at South Bank, you know, in my VW Beetle, setting up my trestle table, and I would make thousands of dollars a day and thought, this is awesome. 
and eventually I was making more on the weekends in my corporate job. And then I thought, well, I'll multiply what works. That was one of the business principles I remember from a mentor. And so I got five other people to do the other markets I couldn't get to. And we were making about 20K a month in cash wow. just from markets. And I thought, that's it. Get rid of the job. Focus all in on the business full time and um, built the wholesale part. And I built a half a million dollar business within about 18 months of quitting. And then I thought, well, if it works in Australia, it has to work in America because <clears throat> there's 360 million people over there. And mm. so I ended up getting on a plane to Vegas to do my very first trade show overseas. And um, I turned up with my six month old baby, 10 suitcases of stock and samples and, and banners and one employee. And we didn't know anyone in America. But within six months of doing that trade show, I had full distribution in all 50 states of the US and Canada. Got my first 10,000 unit order from a distributor, which I didn't have in stock, but I said yes and figured it out. And did 1.8 million in sales that year. And within three years, generated over $10 million. So it was, yeah, crazy journey. I built multiple sales channels. So it wasn't just, you know, online and wholesale. We were diversified in department stores and TV shopping and subscription boxes and all these other ways uh, that when I decided to sell the company, it was actually, it became an asset and I got a 10 times multiple when I exited. So um, on, on earnings, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So that's all you've been up to, eh? What else did you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it was, it was an exciting time. I, you know, I fulfilled a lot of the things that I just dreamed of, you know, when I was in the middle of just getting my head down and getting things done, learning and implementing, I was dreaming about all these things. Yeah. And you, it just went so quick. Like, it all just sort of happened. And um, So, so let's, let's, let's hit the pause button because there's a lot there's in there. So, so, okay, so like, much to rewind on. <laughs> I, I can't wait to dive. So just for context, from the day you rocked up at the Brisbane market South in Bank. South Bank yeah. to the day you sold out to private equity for 10 times multiple... Um, how long was that time period? We were still doing the markets in 2013 and I sold in 2016. But did you start in 2013? Uh, 2012, 2011, 2012, it was sort of like a very just me at the markets. So you're talking about a four to five year journey. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, that's so short. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Amazing. I, you must have had a killer product. I can't wait to do oh, this. Yeah. So this is the big this is the big thing. Everyone's going, but what does she sell? <laughs> yeah. Right. So what do you sell? What were you selling? Well, at the that first time? product was a flop. So just know that. Like when I speak to brands, it's like your first one's not going to maybe get you to the millions. The first one were a pair of shoe clips, like little bows and things that you clip onto your shoes. And I thought they were a great idea. And so that was a flop. That got me to maybe 100 grand in sales. Then I they came... like just to make your shoes look cool? Yeah, I had lots of shoes. Okay. And Eric would love that. Some bows on your shoes. He would love that. Yeah. I've seen those on your Crocs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're kind of like the giblets for your Crocs. They always fall high off my Crocs. I don't know yeah. why. Oh, no, for high heels. <laughs> for high heels. So for that high just heels. flopped. No good. Didn't, didn't work. And yeah, yeah, quality issues. And I yeah, not a lot of people thought. They just bought new pairs of shoes. They didn't need shoe clips. And then I came out with a handbag organizer, which is like a toolbox for your handbag so you can find all your stuff that went really well that kind of got me to half a mil um, but the thing that got me to multi-millions is when I pivoted to beauty and it was this fiber lash extension that was a type of mascara that was in Korea that they weren't selling in Australia in a, in a you know mass way I found it in a Korean beauty store in Sydney and it wasn't even in English. And I remember there's like a Facebook memory that popped up going, does anyone know how to speak Korean? Because I was trying to track down the manufacturer. Anyway, it was like a rabbit hole, like the amazing race on Google trying to find this manufacturer. And I found someone and it was like a person who knew the owner. And anyway, I just started off with a few samples and um, got like, I think, 30, to 30 or 50 boxes and um, went to Vistaprint, put stickers over them because it, weren't, it was in Korean. And no one could understand it. So I was private labelling it myself with Vistaprint and ended up going to a high tea event in, in Brisbane and I was sold out. I had a, like a line of women the whole day wanting these um, my mascara because I was doing the demonstrations and that was the key thing. They could see the before and after. So just made your eyelashes longer and thicker or something. Yeah, so it was like... Um, a mascara tube, very similar to what you get, like a Maybelline, but then it had a separate tube of dry fibres. It looks like tiny little spider legs. So it would stick on and it would look like you're wearing false lashes. 
So, so it was highly demonstrative. You yes, could see it. You could see it and <clears throat> I didn't even have to sell it. People were just watching what I was doing and they were just throwing me the money. And I remember that day I um, was running low. Like I only had like 50 units or something. They wanted to buy my demonstration one. I'm like, I can't <laughs> give you that. Like that's my only one. And I remember calling my sister who was 12 years old at the time to get on a bus and help me because I needed her to take back up uh, back order forms with a credit card authority form because I was pre-selling more than what I had. Um, and that's when I was like, oh my gosh, like I was, I, I need to take this everywhere. And that's what sort of got me into doing these events and expos like Mind Body Spirit Festivals and like the Echo and anywhere where there's lots of women and we would just sell hundreds of this. I've heard this story. Where have I heard this story? Have you been on TV or a podcast or somewhere? <laughs> I've heard this. I'm sure I've heard this well, story it's, somewhere. It's all this press, mate. <laughs> Probably the press. Or... This, this wow. story reminds me a lot of Simon Beard's story with Culture Kings where he was at the markets trying to find a hit product. He missed out on the camera product, which yeah, was... Yeah, that was a great story. Great story, the Hero Cameras, um, which went on to be a billion-dollar company. Um, but then he found those dicky shorts that were a hot product at that time and he literally was buying them I think from Walmart at retail and selling them here for like five times but it's a great lesson before we move on for all entrepreneurs listening to this don't miss what Jelaine said she failed with two products and so often people take failure so personally when it's actually not to do with the person like mm. it was the same Jelaine at the markets at the same time with three different products two were duds and one made her a multi-millionaire mm. Can, which is the can we, which is the lashes? Can we can we touch on that a little bit more? Because yeah. I, I know a few people that sell their products at markets, and they go to market week after week, month after month, and they're never really making that much in sales. What was it in you that encouraged you or forced you to go out there and look at other products and other ideas? Because a lot of people would just keep going yeah. through the paces, like. What was it within well, you that... I, when I was selling into wholesale, a lot of the boutiques were starting... It was starting to dry up a little bit because it wasn't a consumable product. And I sort of thought, wouldn't it be great if I had like a consumable product at Beauty? And it literally it, that opportunity landed in my lap within a couple of weeks. You mean products that people buy over and over, right? Yeah. So yeah. I thought Beauty, you know, you'll run out of something and have to buy it again. And I had a very strict criteria of like, okay, well, I want it to be consumable. It's got to be something that is not really in the market. That's a problem solution. So I had like a, a very loose kind of criteria and it was, yeah. As you get more experienced, I think that's one of the most important things for entrepreneurs is to dial in that shopping list of what mm. a good opportunity yeah. looks like. Yeah. <clears throat> and when you start, you just get emotional about the very first thing you see and you fall in love with your own idea and you're not really objective. Can you, can you put some metrics around this? Because it is a, it, it's, it's easy to focus on, okay, you sold out for millions to private equity uh, at a 10 multiple, which is amazing, by the way. Good on you. <laughs> and we'll get to that in a minute. But, but where did you start? Like how much money did it cost to get your first batch of stuff from Korea? And how did you pay for it? Like, because I want people to understand yeah. that this is possible. This is what's amazing about Australia is you can start with, you get a winning idea with not a lot of cash. What was the story there, the metrics around it? I think the more that I was selling out of it, I was more confident to place bigger orders. So it started with 50, then it went to 300, what then 1,000. It was like $13 landed for one tube and I was selling it for $69. So thirteen dollars landed. You ordered fifty tubes. Yep. So you're talking about seven hundred bucks. Yeah, or not much, not much. And like even before that, like when I quit corporate and I was in like all that debt, like I was flipping my stuff. I was going to the market selling my stuff, like my shoes, my handbags, like all the mm. stuff I didn't need as startup capital. Uh, you know, you just constantly flip it and then have capital. And then I did my first trade show with that capital, and that's sort of what really took things to the next level for me. So you must have been so excited, wake up on Saturday morning going, I'm going to the markets, I'm going to sell all the stuff, knowing that people love it when they see it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I only did that for a few weeks until I started multiplying what worked. Like my next thing was like, hey, well, I can't do this on my own. I need other people. And I found four, to, four or five really key sort of casual staff that were willing to, you know, get up at four in the morning and set up. And they became part of like the... That, that journey and actually one of them I just saw the other day is just one EY like a, she was she won this big business award and she used to be one of my market skills at West End and I, was, and I always knew that she had it in her that she'll be so, so how many markets were you at we were at um, West End Eagle Farm Jan Powers South Bank and um, there was another one and how much was each market store making on a weekend anywhere from 500 to a thousand dollars a day 
wow. And so you had four of these going and you're just cranking it out yeah. and your markup's 5X. Yeah. And yeah. how so much is a stall? To, to like $100. For a stall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're that. getting thousands of people there. You know, like it's already established. People are going, you're getting 10,000, 5, 10,000 people going at each market. Instead of, because I tried the pop-ups at Westfield. That was the worst thing I ever did. It's the only thing that I've tried that actually lost money was doing a pop-up at Westfield. So anytime someone tells me, oh, we've got this, you know, thing at Westfield, like don't do it. Is that just because the so rent expensive. is so high or they don't convert as the well? The rent is high and people aren't there for the pop-ups. They're there for the stores. Right. It, yeah. So with the actual mascara, what made it different than a regular mascara? Because you had that separate tube of dry fibers, it added that yep. real volume. So it was really instant. And so the only alternative was mascara, which just you know, doesn't do, it was okay. Yep. Or eyelash extensions at the salon, which cost $200 each yeah. time. It was annoying. And so there was nothing in between. And I was the in between. And that's why I justified my price at $69. So how does that compare to the products you're using at the moment? Uh, my mascara? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Eric, Eric, Eric. So what's cool about this is, you know, and I always say this to, to people uh, as much as possible, it's really difficult, like in a space like that, if you go in and say, we've got vegan m mascara that's been, you know, blessed by the tears of a virgin Buddhist, um, you know, that's all good, but you can't see it, you know, and these days it's a, a lot of people are doing that kind of stuff and it's really difficult to actually break through. But when you can demonstrate and see, especially in a world of social media, like if you think about High Smile, right? I mm. always refer to these guys. They go, this is your tooth and this is it with V34, the purple stuff. And you can see it's instantly white. And now they're doing a billion dollars a year in sales. And, it's and so demonstrative. It's, it's, it's so reusable powerful. as well, right? Like I right. think that that's a massive, massive point. Like my, my dad's been doing trash and treasure markets for all his, all his life, but he's never landed on a killer product because trash and treasure markets are just different products every week. But there's so many people out there that you see at these markets that have put so much energy, so much time into their product, but it's something that people would buy time. once. Mm. And so you, you really cottoned on to something super important for, for your success. Yeah. No? And then we had people on subscription and we had people who were just such super fans that they wouldn't go on holidays without a new batch of mascara. Like they had to stop at the office on the way to the airport. And this is on, this is sort of before the boom of social, like Instagram yeah. and TikTok. I mean, imagine if you were doing that now with oh, yeah. instant TikTok, it'd be like Jelaine the billionaire today, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> now, what did you do um, in your corporate role? I was um, making TV commercials for a living and doing PR and advertising, marketing. So for big companies like McDonald's and Vodafone, Tourism Queensland, um, the Lotto account. So they were really amazing accounts and it was like a dream job, but it was very, you had to be flawless as well. Like you had, like you can't make mistakes when you're yeah. working with um, some of these uh, accounts and it was just a lot of pressure. And I remember just having to be at the office at 8 a.m. and leaving at 6, 7 o'clock. And it, that was never going to change. Like, I looked at my bosses and they were still there at 9 o'clock. And I'm like, I don't want that. That's not what I, you know, I'm so, I, that was not what Carrie Bradshaw was showing on Sex and the City. That's what I thought I was getting. Because um, I think most, most girls sort of growing up around that time, we had these, like, delusions of corporate and, um, hmm. you know, and so it, I only lasted two years. And I was, it was very apparent to me that this is not it. So your learnings being in that corporate role, do you think they attributed to the success that you had in your in your business? Oh, yeah, way? definitely. The systems, the, you know, the structure, the processes, the, you know, management, all of that stuff definitely helped. I think anyone in business, I even tell my daughter who's 11, I said, look, it'd be great if your first job could be Macca's because it's a great way to learn mm -hmm. systems and leadership. And, you know, if you want to have a business, that's awesome. I'll support you. But I think you should, you know, maybe go to go to uni and, and do a corporate job and just see that what that's like. Because I think it's a good, you get a you get the, the good parts of corporate. C can we talk through that a little bit more, though? Because I've been in a corporate or semi-corporate role and I've, I'm running a business. And running a business is quite demanding as, as well. So... What do you think it is for you that makes running a business more rewarding than that corporate grind, other than the money? Just freedom. I just like being, even though I've worked so much harder in my own business, like we all do, it's just that satisfaction that it's your thing, it's your ideas. And there's no better feeling than you go, like being on holidays and walking into a shop and seeing your product there that you didn't even know that this place existed. 
And I think it's just that satisfaction of an idea that you've had and it's being out in the world, out in the wild and seeing people use it. I think that the, you can't beat that. It's cre creative expression. And yeah, yeah, I, I think so. And seeing somebody use it in the wild would be kind of yeah. crazy, right? Like putting on your product. So l let's go back a little bit because I want to I take people into that story a bit more. You said something about, you know, off camera before we started, you said that your... Um, was it that you found out you were pregnant on at the same time that your first shipment came in from South Korea? Um, did that freak you out? At how, how was, what was going on at that time? And then how did you manage to do this with a young baby going to Las Vegas, keeping up with all the expectations and pressures that women uniquely have, right? Like I know it is different being a man and being a woman in business you got a partner probably and you've got a child now to worry about and a business and, and the business has babies <laughs> you know, called yeah. employees. So tell us about that when you found out you were pregnant and then managing the business and the baby and all of that while you've got this fast growing business. It was just, um, it was just nothing really was there to say, oh, well, I've got to slow down. If anything, it was like, let's ramp this up. I'm going to have a baby. Like, let's get this going. <laughs> And, and so I was literally on a plane every two, three weeks, just doing events and trade shows all around Australia. And, um, you know, I got to like 33 weeks or something and the, the doctor was like, you can't fly anymore. But I was, you know, doing demonstrations on, on my feet all day. Like, it didn't stop me. Like, I didn't negotiate with myself. It's just like, you just do it. You just get it done. And this is an opportunity. There's, I've never seen a product go, like, go this fast and, and be loved by this many people. So it was like my responsibility to get, get it out there. And... Um, you know, had the baby, it, it sort of forced me as well to get management so when I could have mat leave. And so I, you know, got, got people to help manage the business so that I could um, have a few weeks off after having the baby. And then literally six weeks, I think she, yeah, six, six weeks after the baby, I was back doing trade shows and breastfeeding behind trade show booths and so had nannies. Yeah, I had a nanny in Sydney and Melbourne and my mum would sometimes fly with me. Uh, it was just part of it. And then when we got the success in Australia doing these big events, then we had the confidence to take it to America and brought, brought my, um, yeah, Ava, she's 11 now, but yeah, brought her over. And she couldn't even sit up. Like she was six months old and we did, yeah, we had like 10 or 13 pieces of suit, like suitcases and like baby stuff. And we couldn't even fit into two cabs. We had to get a limo everywhere because we just had so much stuff. You're this tiny girl with this massive entourage yeah, of suitcases absolutely. everywhere. Absolutely. We actually had to rehearse how we were going to do it on the driveway. <laughs> so we had like the big bungee tape. Like we would just bungee tape all the suitcases and push it along. <laughs> and like what I would do with that, you know, with the baby and the pram. And so we rehearsed it because we knew that this is going to happen when we get to LAX. We needed to have a plan. So, um, like, I really planned it out. And my assistant, she had to plan this limo. Like, every time we had to move hotels or whatever, we couldn't fit into two or three cars. We had to just get li stretch limos everywhere. Amazing. <laughs> People would have thought you were, like, famous, eh? Like, yeah. look at this lady, 13 suitcases, <laughs> rolling around in limos. That <laughs> dressed beautifully, no only, doubt. <laughs> yeah, only to know that it's full of mascara. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Mascara well, like and Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, uh, you know, jokes aside, let's talk a little bit about the journey. I want to talk about America in a minute because I think all Australians, I've lived and worked in America for five years and, and it was life-changing for me. I absolutely loved it. But um, I want to just really unpack that journey a little bit more from like girl finds product in a Korean supermarket or something <laughs> in Sydney, imports, you know, $700 worth, probably bought on a credit card or with FPOS and then scales up. So what, what are the milestones looking back now? So you start in the markets, you get some of your friends, you talk them into coming and selling at the markets, you're doing $500 to $1,000 a day each market. You said you were going to trade shows around Australia. So for those who don't know about the beauty business, what trade shows were you going to? Were they public facing? Were they industry trade shows? What, what were they? Why did you go? How did they work? What did they cost? What yeah. was the, how did it grow your business? Because <clears throat> I know there's people listening to this going, if I get a killer product to the market, I can, I can do that. But what do I do next to have a multi-million dollar exit? Yeah, well, the first thing I did was go where the buyers are. You know, I, my, my whole thing was instead of trying to sell one or two units to a customer at the markets, I want to get wholesale customers and they're paying me 700 bucks a, an order. So the way to do that is to do a trade show. And in Australia, we had 
um, Read Gift Fair, which is a home and gift show. We have AGHA, which is another gift show. We've got Fashion Exposed. You've just got to look for it because they're, they're all flying in, people who own businesses, to, to stock up with new products. And so you've got to turn up. Number one rule of business is show up. So these are trade shows for retail store owners. Yep. And I suppose now probably e-commerce store owners yeah. as well. And so they turn up, you, you buy a booth. Mm-hmm. And yep. you show your products just like you were at South Bank kind of thing. Exactly. Except these people are going to buy 50, 100,000 units off you at a time. Yeah. So they would, they would put wholesale orders in. So anywhere from 300 to $1,000. But they'd be recurring then after that. And so your ROI from that trade show is awesome. And so, yeah, that's how you build your wholesale. And then we were still doing markets. So I would be doing a trade show at least every couple of months. And then we would do events where there was like a shopping event, like the Eka or the Royal Easter Show or Mind Body Spirit Festival or the Home Show. Wherever there was lots of women, more than 10,000 of them on a weekend, that's where I wanted to be. Mm. And so how much does a trade show cost and how many people did you have on a stand? Yeah. So the first one, the very, very first one, I've done over 50 of them now globally, but the very first one was um, like three or four grand and I that was like all the things that I flipped at the market selling my stuff to to pay for it we didn't have I didn't have money for accommodation um this was in Melbourne and I couch surfed like I stayed with strangers because I couldn't afford a hotel and they ended up like long story short those couch surfers became some of my best friends and they were in my wedding it was like awesome um but like I bootstrapped everything even when we were making millions of dollars I never flu business I always stayed at like three four star places like I it was all about just keeping everything um you know at the, the cost level as possible because as soon as you start overextending yourself then the ROI isn't there or you know the profitability is, isn't there so we yeah I just continued to multiply what worked and just did as many of them so is that how you picked up David Jones in Australia from a trade show or uh no no, no. So we got David Jones after we really made it in America. Is that right? Yeah, I made How it in Australian. America. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was already in 110 Nordstrom stores and 130 Dillard stores and then David Jones came in last. Like they came in finally at the end when they saw what I was doing. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So you basically go to these trade shows. You spent three or four grand on the first one. Yeah. You couch surfed your way there. Because the thing about products businesses is as product owners, you're always thinking, I might spend a thousand bucks a night in a hotel, but that's so many that's st- stock. That's so much stock, yeah. and I could turn that stock into three thousand, five thousand dollars, right? So that's a that's the mindset. So you're down there, you couch surf, you go to your first trade show, you get your first orders. So from that three thousand dollars, can you tell us any yeah. stories about how many orders did you go? How many retailers did you get? I, so that that was ten thousand of written orders from that trade show that they paid me up front and. Yeah, and that was like, okay, cool, let's keep doing this. Let's so at the, I just want to be really detailed on this because I know if I was a young person listening to this, I'd want to know all the details here yeah. because I'd be making a plan and the smart ones listening right now are making a plan going, right, step one, step two, step three. So um, so when you say $10,000 of orders, do you write the orders at the show? Do you have an order form yeah. that you get? order them? form. And, and this is the other thing, because I was learning so much about marketing, sales, communication, like all the things... I created my own systems and then I would just multiply what worked and then I would train people to shadow me and then repeat the process. And so it became more predictable. So if I wanted to do a trade show in Paris, we knew our numbers because we had done it everywhere else. And as long as they followed the system and the script, then we knew what we were going to get. So from that, it was like, what are the things that we can get people? Like, what what are some methods, mogul methods, that I know that will get the sale on the day? Because my I hate losing money. And I wanted to know that if I packed up on my last day that I've made my money and then some. And so things, because I'm up against these retailers that have been, like other brands that have been around for, for years and here I am. So you're just getting them to fill out an order form? Yeah, it's like, this is what I have. Fill out the form. Minimum order is this. This is the this package is the best sellers. Do you want it? Yeah. If you leave credit card details today, I'll take five percent off and free shipping. So they pay up front. Yeah. And was there any terms at all? Or was it all just no, pay? No. All up front. I, I never had terms. And I just anytime anyone asked for terms, I said 
maybe in six months. Like I left it open, but like I get paid before you get stock. And that's how I was able to bankroll it early on. I and, love that. And this is still just one product at this point in time? Or yeah, did that, you was have just other a, that was just, that was the shoe clips and the handbag organizers. That was okay. the first trade show. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then your, your makeup. So you did 10,000. And then I added the makeup. Yeah. So you did 10,000 orders on the shitty products. Yeah. The and, so, products. And, when you took the, and then when you went to the, no offense, but I mean, yeah. com, you said it yourself compared to your other stuff. So then you went to your next trade show with your mascara? Yeah, so within like a few months, um, I, I did the, that high tea event with all the women and I thought, oh, okay, we need to do trade shows in the beauty world. And so we were doing like all the trade shows. And, uh, and, and luckily I picked a name that didn't pigeonhole me to just selling the, you know, it was Cherry Bloom, so it could be anything really. And just kept multiplying what worked. And then eventually when I knew that like the beauty products was it, I wasn't doing I wasn't doing the other products so much. It was just more of an add-on. If they would liked it, then we'll, we'll. So you've basically got this templated system now. You're going to these trade shows. You're rocking up with all your suitcases full of mascara. You know you're making thousands of dollars in retail orders. They're not only ordering on the day that are going to when they sell out keep reordering, and then you went to America. One more detail before we talk about America. When an order comes in, like somebody, let's say it's you know Mark's Beauty Store, he bought buy you know an order for two grand um when he goes to reorder how does he do that does he go to your website does he call you up what does he do to reorder usually they email or -hmm. sometimes they need someone to pick up the phone and i think that's what people don't do nowadays there's like a lot of these shop business owners they they're not behind a computer like they're at the shop doing their thing and so you have to kind of prompt them or you get reps to make sure they're calling in and getting reorders. did you have reps that i found them yeah so when they saw me and this is a part of, you know, showing up where your people are in the industry is um, you get to meet them. They're already going to all the places that they want to sell to and they're looking for a hot product. So you're paying them commission only to open so, up all these new accounts. Uh, these are reps that handle other kinds of products yeah. as well. Yep. So they added your product to their product. Mm-hmm. And how did you meet them? At the trade shows. At the trade shows. So yeah. they come up and go, hey, I'm a rep. I represent these brands. Can I rep your product? And they get a yeah. commission. Take them out for dinner, build relationship, give them everything they need to be supported to sell through. And they, they would just fax or phone, phone um, send photos of the order form while they're on the road. And then we would process it. And so... See, I didn't even know those people existed. Yeah. Yeah. A friend of mine is doing that right now. Um, they've got a, a kid's clothing brand and they went to one of their first trade, uh, trade sh- shows in Europe and they made contacts with a lot of agents that now want to represent their brand for a commission. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's, that's um, amazing. This, yeah. was, this was between 2013 and 16, was it? Yeah. yeah. So a lot's changed in the e-commerce world, world since then. Would, would you use this same system and model today? If, Always. If, yep. Always and it's more fun. Yep. Because I love people and I love going to events and I love traveling. And I would just pay really good people to manage my ad accounts because to me, that's not where my genius zone is. And I'd love, like, I love the game of being at a trade show. You never know who you're going to meet, what's going to happen, having drinks with people in your industry. Like, that's, when I look back at my journey, like, that's what I miss. It's the, right. the atmosphere. But if I was just, like, starting an e-com brand, it's just me in my room. Yeah. Like that's just not. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't. I can yeah. imagine you at a trade show, just like entertaining, <laughs> having fun with everybody. There's a little powerhouse from yeah. Australia. Breastfeeding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, Unbelievable. It's, it's, so what I love about this story is that people kind of look at markets and go, "Oh, you know, these are just hippies selling soap on the weekend." But the beautiful thing about the markets is you get direct consumer feedback. And I've been to a ton of markets. I don't know what it is. You just. You know, Saturday morning, you grab a piccolo and you walk through and there's always one or two stands that are just like pumping and there's this vibe there. And these are the people that have cottoned onto something, right? Um, But it's great because it's a really cost effective way for a few hundred dollars to actually engage with Mm. consumers. And these days, it is not just hippies selling soap. There are some really interesting, cool products that are at markets. And and you you get that all important litmus test of your idea face to face mm. in and, real time and it is like a training ground for you in sales and marketing because you have like for me if i didn't do a great job or if it started raining like i'd make no money like mm-hmm. that was that's the reality of it so some people just turn up and smile at people but i wasn't like that i was like have you seen this before i would demonstrate my products 
It's a great know, training ground. I, I agree. I, I, when I first got the toilets, I went to trade shows. And if you want to have a challenge, try to stop people at a trade show to look at a toilet. <laughs> like it's not, it is want to test it? Yeah. the easiest and, and, thing to do. And I just found some like hooks, you know, Correct. to kind of like disarm people. So it's like, have you seen this before? Oh, let me show you. I'll Give me your handbag. Yeah. I'll do it for you. As soon as I would, um, you know, reorganize someone's handbag with one of my products – they wanted it. Like, they didn't want me to take it out. Yes. So, it was just all these things that you it's learn. finding is, those hooks, yeah. right, is, and that, that are scalable. And those can transfer to online ads now. And, like, we tested stuff like, you know, this is the coolest toilet you've ever seen in your life. And I would get my guys to try that. Then we would go, watch this. Or, you know, and those things can be amplified online mm. at scale, which mm. is very, very cool. Well, a big thing, like when I when I say I've done over 50 trade shows, like one of the biggest things that I always did that made a huge difference was having a hook to come to my booth. So I always had the free, free eyelash extensions, for example, and that would people would get people kind of picking their interest. And then as soon as you had two or three people at the booth and it just got other people to the booth and we had like 10, 15 women every hour of the day. So people were getting FOMO. So all these distributors <laughs> that I ended up finding were just observing what the hell I was doing because I was the busiest booth on my island. It happened every time we went to a new city. So you're getting your hands on the customers with the product, engaging, you know, Simon says this about retail, you know, with, with Culture Kings, I've watched plenty of pods with Simon. He said that retail is about theatre. Mm -hmm. It's about entertainment and engagement. And that's where it originally started with, you know, that whole you know, back in the day, you know. So let, let's talk a little bit about the day that Jelaine packs up these suitcases and goes, right, we're going to jump the pond and we're going to head north, north east, <laughs> up to, was it a Vegas, Vegas. stranger? Yeah, Vegas. Vegas. So Las Vegas, whole different level. Yeah, it's so, the best. Yeah, <laughs> the best, right? So tell us about that journey. What was going on? I, I want to... I want to be feeling like I'm writing on your suitcase. What was going through your mind? How did you feel? What was it like to write the check out for the booth? Like that must have been scary because it's in US dollars and it's a bigger number. So t talk us through that the moment you decide to do it, you invested the money, you're going, yeah. you're going out. Let's go well, there I think with you. I was just sort of like on this high of like just selling out of all of my products at all these events. And we, I just had confidence that, it, you know, my system works. So I just need to now try it in America. What's, you know, whatever I got to lose will be a great holiday. If we sell over all, all of the samples and, you know, it, we, it would have paid for the holiday. So we'll just give it a go. So I brought one um, employee with me. And yeah, the booth actually is actually cheaper in America. Oh, really? Yeah. It's Had you been to America before? No, did I? Yeah, yeah, I like to New York for a holiday, but like not for business. Okay, so you and a friend. Me and my friend and my six month old baby in 10 suitcases of stock. Okay, so you rock up. Rock up. We had a nanny that we interviewed via Skype to look after the baby. Um, who would just, you know, push her along during... Where, where was the event and where were you staying? It was at Mandalay Bay. Mandalay so Bay. all the conventions, like the big conventions, um, always happened there. And did you stay there? We stayed at Luxor because it was cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> That's the pyramid, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the pyramid. pyramid. So you stayed, yeah. The first time I went to Vegas, I stayed at the pyramid. Same. Yeah, yeah. And so you, you stayed at Luxor, you stayed at the pyramid, like we're super yeah. tacky Australians. Yeah. Um, and then you go down to Mandalay Bay. Yeah. You set up this booth with your eyelashes. And were you nervous? No, I was really excited. And we had staff that were American that we found on Craigslist who we gave them the training manual the week before. We did the Skype interview and we met them for the first time an hour before the trade show. How good is Craigslist? <laughs> I, I recruited all my employees in my animation company in Hollywood from Craigslist. And Americans oh. just have this attitude, right? Like they, they, they love it. They love being there and being part of it. Yeah. So you got these Americans. How many Americans rocked up? I think up we had four and then it was me and one Aussie employee. <clears throat> so there was about six of us all up. On and the stand. On the stand. It was like a three by three meter booth. That was all we needed in every trade show. No, no more than that. And four chairs. And it was like a system. Like you do the lashes. It takes two minutes. And this is what you say to get asked for the sale. Can I grab you a box? Once they're like, oh, I love it. Um, and then it was just like a machine. And, and we had like, I remember we took a photo of all the cash. <laughs> we took with like 18 grand <laughs> USD. Wow. And that, so that trade show, I didn't realize at the time that you, you're not meant to sell. Like it's a, a show <laughs> where you're just, show, you know, you've got these high level distributors who are buying pallets at a time. And I didn't know. I thought it was just like the ones that we do in Australia. <laughs> but I'm like, I'm not giving this for free. Like if you want it, here's a credit card authority form and we'll process it later. And some of them, like I didn't know, but they were like, do you even know who I am? Like we had some of those people. Of like, I'm like, well, if you, if you want it, like the sample is this 
this is the price. But because of that, it was like it that's, created this demand. That's awesome. Anyway, so I think day one, day two, it, we were selling out and I didn't realize, like I, I realized that it was actually like a big deal trade show where this wasn't just a, a hairdresser or someone coming in. This was like a distributor who they're buying pallets. So the, bit, the first 10,000 unit order came from that trade show. Okay. But he came to my booth, well, his staff did, like I never got to meet. Him. His name was Jerry, good old Jerry. And he started off with, I think, um, 12 units. And then the next day, they're like, actually, can you make it 60? And I'm like, cool, all right, we'll ship it out, da-da-da. By the time he went back to his office and showed the sales reps, because I didn't know that he was actually a big deal, they then emailed and said, we want 10,000 units. So who was this buyer? What, where were these 10,000 units headed? He was, um, he was a, a beauty distributor in Canada. So he was in a place in Alberta. So, so my first distributors were actually Canadian. So I had to learn how to say Saskatchewan and, <laughs> and, and I had to learn how to ship it when it was freezing cold and it would need to be thawed out. Like, wow. So the Canadians were the ones that really gave me the big orders up like early on. And then the Americans started hearing about it. So, so they were picking up the phones going, have you heard of this brand? It's the fastest selling SKU we've had. Wow. Okay. So again, comes back to that killer product. So let, let's, let's pause for a moment. So you, this guy says, I want 10,000 orders. Honestly, what did you do at that moment? I freaked out. <laughs> like I remember I was, we were already in New York by then because we've done the trade show. Now we're having a holiday and we were like, yay. So we got the email and I was like jumping around in the how, hotel. How room. many orders had you done to date? From that show. From, from so what was that? No, no, up until that oh, yeah. you got that 10,000 order. Oh, gosh. The maximum we ever sold was maybe 25 units. Wow. And you get one order for 10,000. It's like we had a guy in here with the greats, you know, um, yeah. Tim. And Tim uh, has 2,000 outlets across Australia after 20 years. His first distributor in the US has... 2,100 outlets, <laughs> one right. distributor, um, which is the same sort of scale that, that, that people don't realise. So, okay, so you're in New York, you get an email saying 10,000 units. This is a, an order, I'm just doing the quick math here, how much is it a unit? It was at that time I got it down to, um, I, I negotiated down to about eight, nine dollars landed. Eight or nine bucks landed, so it's a hundred thousand mm. dollars roughly your cost and how much are you selling it for? I was selling it to them for about 13. Okay. So you've got this order that's going to put multiple five figures profit in your pocket. What, what did you do? Did you have the money to place no. the order? Did you talk to your supplier about terms? What, how did you finance the order? First, I freaked out and went on WhatsApp to talk to the factory. Like, how are we going to do this? Because my product took six, month, six months to make as well. So it was wow. also not just the cash issue. It was like the production issue. I know, it was annoying. Six months to make this, these mascara tubes. Um, so I spoke to Jerry and said, Jerry, thank you for the order. However, if you want 10,000 units, I'll need payment up front and you have to wait X amount of months. And Jerry said yes. Wow. And that's like, apparently that's crazy. Like that doesn't happen. But they could see how quickly it was selling and they didn't want to miss out. And so at the same time, I was starting to get all these people going and like other distributors, another Canadian guy, awesome guy, Darren, really good friend of mine now. And then essentially I had 17 of the top beauty distributors in North America and they all wanted at least 2,000 to 10,000 units each. So I pulled it all together and told them all the same thing. If you want it, I need payment up front and you need to be okay with waiting X amount. And they were all happy to do it. At this point was... was patenting the product and all that any of that going through your mind was it a possibility even is it something not really I just knew that I would get copycats that's why I was willing to just go hard right now like right. Get, get it in and build it and become build the first brand. yeah beef. and I, that's what we would say we were the original and the best fiber lash so my competitor that, that came after me we were about six months apart and he did 200 million in sales but he did a multi-level marketing strategy whereas i was straight retail and professional distribution so different incredible story like honestly i you know i think sometimes we get in our own way i love how you just fronted up these yanks that had big wallets and just told them this is yeah, how it this is. is how it is you know balls of steel <laughs> and um 
you know, I, I just have so much respect for that. And I can just imagine you, this little pocket rocket from Australia saying, this is how it is, you want it, do it, boom. Yeah. And I think the Americans would have loved that as well, just your straight talk, real mm. talk. They knew you had a good thing and they probably looked at you and go, we can trust her and we, we want to support her. Was there an element of that, do you think? Oh, absolutely. I think when they meet you in person as well, I think that's why it's so, like I always tell people, just go to these things and meet people in real life because that's where you're building relationships. So before Jerry transferred the money over, obviously he rang me. He was like, just, you know, we're transferring it now. I just want to make sure, like, you know, everything everything we talked about is going to happen. I'm like, yep, it's, it's happening. Um, but that wouldn't have happened if I met him on an email. Like, if it was mm, a no. cold out, like, you have to meet them in person. I took them out for drinks and dinner and got to know, gave them Tim Tams. Like, we really build relationships yeah. and that's what this is about. And so they trusted me and um, I... I just knew that this would transform their businesses too because they, they've all been sort of, they've been around the block. They know what a good product is and they've kind of been waiting for something really big. Yeah. And so they, and did they turn out to be recurring good accounts for you? Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So my reorders would be like 40 to 100 grand per customer. Wow. At a time. Because they'd be buying, they would be forecasting what they needed. They didn't want to be out of stock mm. and they knew our production timing. So it was always very transparent. Oftentimes people sort of think, you know, looking from the, why didn't they just go to Korea and do it themselves? You know, and like people don't understand that retailers are retailers for the most part. That's what they do. They need people like you to do what you do. It's kind of like a supply chain. And I find that a lot when I was doing business in the US, people tend to stick to their lane. They don't generally try to vertically integrate and do all that sort of stuff. They, they stick to their lane, they do what they do. And if you just do the right thing and apply a little bit of Aussie charm to it, when I was there, it worked really, really well. And I deal with our toilets are in the US. We've got an amazing relationship that's just built on that just honest, straightforward mm. Aussie way of doing stuff. Um, it's just such a great story, Jelaine. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I, I love the style of business, you know. These days, it's all about online, no face-to-face, -face, mm. you know, Google ads, Facebook yeah. ads, never meeting clients. And I'm, you know, we're probably similar in age. And <clears throat> I, I just love that, you know, you can still build businesses like these, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, you have a good, you, so you know, you have a good product, right? If you're going to go to a trade show overseas, sit there and, and sell this, you know, and uh, yeah, ha hats off to you. It's amazing. And mm -hmm. I just keep repeating the story in my head going like corporate job, I'm sure, you know, six figures, um, you know, to quitting and couch surfing like yeah. what, what, what what were you telling yourself you know you're selling personal items at markets to raise funds for your first trade trade show in australia and you're then couch surfing like what are you telling yourself going from this six figure you know comfortable making tv commercials mm. pretty cool with a baby with a baby <clears throat> like what are you telling yourself at that point because i, I know a lot of listeners here are stuck in the same, yeah. you know, I have friends right now that I talk to on a, on a weekly basis that are in the same headspace going like, I see what you do and I want to do what you do. And, but and, they're stuck. They and you're feel talking stuck. about not long later. Like you're talking mm. two years later, you're talking to Jerry who's hitting you up with a hundred of <laughs> 10,000, yeah. a hundred thousand dollar order yeah. in Las Vegas. That's but like it, unbelievable. But I, if I, you're not couch surfing, this doesn't happen. If you're not right. selling your personal items, mm. like your bags and shoes and these fancy yeah. things to raise three, four grand, what are you telling yourself at that time? I, I was What's, just so where's, unreasonable. Where does the belief come from? I'm just so unreasonable. Like I just knew, I had dreams like I I'm as corny as it sounds but like I knew that I was meant to be doing more and I really invested heavily in personal development like you name it I've seen them live I've read their book and I just applied everything and I just started to believe that I was worthy of more and then I can do it and then I have the capacity and the talent and the work ethic and I can you know just get it done and I did and I just didn't negotiate with myself if ever that 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 voice I just slapped that yeah. voice out of my head. But weren't people telling you like you're crazy? You just, oh yeah, you, I had you can't do yeah. this. You know? My ex boyfriend at the time, at the time, and my mum had an intervention with me because I was like put my last credit card down to do this, like some kind of um, personal development. You know, life. It was called life design. It was like seven days of intense. Like, what do you want in life? Let's put wow. goals down. Let's do all this stuff. Like, it was all mindset. And I was probably one of the youngest ones there. Everyone was having a midlife crisis and I was having a quarter life crisis. But it just, I just knew what I wanted. 
and I was just willing to do whatever it took. And most of those things now, when I look back, I've achieved it. So and your family literally had an intervention. Literally had an intervention, yeah. which shows you, you know, like the people who love you most are doing what they, they they feel they're doing, but sometimes they're just dead wrong. It's it's so it's so prevalent. Um, you, you go to an Anthony Robbins event and and someone will bag you. Your family will say, oh, "What are you wasting seven grand on that event for?" And, yeah, it's a scam. And even successful people all over the place are, are, are you know, bagging those events. But honestly, when you're coming from nothing. Those events, they work. Yeah. Well, and you're saved, proof, they you're saved proof me. of that. They and saved me for sure. You know, yeah, that's when when I was failing at everything. That's all I had was those events to someone to reinforce a positive message. It wasn't abundant like it is today with podcasts. Is that where the confidence comes from? Because I remember seeing you on stage, right, uh, and it was probably halfway through when when I arrived, and I and I seen you up there, and I didn't know who you were, and I just I felt the confidence. I'm like this this woman is a you know, a weapon up there. And I can feel it now, the way you speak, the way you portray yourself, the way you walked in the door in, in the studio. Where does that confidence come from? Is that is that from doing the personal development as well or does that come from or childhood? Just from definitely, definitely part of personal development. I think when you have the courage to go for it, the confidence comes because you start to see what you've done. You don't doubt yourself. You have belief. And, you know, I talk to myself like I, like a good friend needs to encourage somebody so I didn't grow up with you know really good parents that you know gave gave me all the reassurance I had to do it for myself and so my mentors were you know the Tony Robbins or like all the people that we probably have uh, studied my peer group were like that you know so I had to really just Im- immerse myself in that audio like I power talk going constantly on the car and and just anytime someone would come into, yeah, to talk about sales and marketing, I would put my last dollar to go and fly and see them and couch surf, you know, just to hear Robert Kiyosaki speak or Tim Ferriss or whoever. And because I paid that price, I paid attention. So if I was willing to put my last, however many, hundred dollars down to go and, you know, be at this event, then with those notes, I would review it. I would write it, I would reflect on it. Even today, sometimes I, I take out some of these notes that I've highlighted from like years ago and just like remind myself what I already know mm-hmm. that I've forgotten. Work instills the worth, right? S- That's- Success leaves clues at these events, but you've got to pay the price of admission yeah. for, it to, for it to resonate. Yeah, people say, oh, it should be free. And I'm like, no, when you invest in it, you take skin it in the seriously, game. you pay attention, skin in the game. It's so powerful. And, I, and for the, all of you people out there watching that have invested in Tony Robbins or in a live event of some description, you know, that is the play that is so common. And you will, you know, your friends might laugh at you and the friends might say, oh, you got sucked into another one of those mm, events. You got brainwashed. Yeah, yeah. Well, most people's brains could do with a good wash. <laughs> um, I totally agree. <laughs> you know, because it does pay off in the long term, you know. I've got a guest with me here in the studio today. They're watching it, and Lee and Jamie and Lee's built incredible companies. But like me, he's been to all the Tony Robbins seminars. He's been to all, all the crazy stuff, you know, that he's done. He's built companies with massive revenues as a result of it. Um, we're all crazy, you know. We all do that stuff. We're all unreasonable. So, Jelaine, tell us about this transition um, from okay. You now go to America. You start crushing in America. When did the approach? come and how did the approach come for the exit because you sold on a multiple attend to private equity it's not publicly disclosed what you sold for as a as a matter of terms in that sale but you know at the end of the day i'm sure you did very very well um but how did that approach happen did you go door knocking or did they knock on your door yeah it was really interesting Um, because i was i was always like looking out for government grants and things that we can get some benefit uh, help from and you know epic now fr like the export finance and so my lawyers and accountants didn't tell me all these things i could tap into and i found this business advisor that was government appointed that came in to do an audit on the business and said you've got a really great business but you need more cash because you you're saying no to opportunities because you don't have the capital and so i had this realization like oh like not having the capital we're saying no to new countries opening up like brazil and like we had all we had eight countries that we opened up in that time and every time we opened up a new country they needed more stock and and so i i figured well well we'll just raise some capital and so through that process i decided we'll just sell it 
because they want to buy a business. And, um, you know, got a mergers and acquisitions team in, in Brisbane and was, like, in the deep end, like, had no idea how this world worked, had to learn all this new, like, legal jargon on term sheets and shareholders agreements and really had to get schooled up there. So just, just pause there. I got a mergers and acquisitions people, right? How? What do you do? You look up the yellow pages? Like, no, okay, so, so network. How, network. So network. you go to your network and say, I'm thinking of selling my business. Yeah. So Who um, can help? Yeah, my network. So I was an EO, an entrepreneur's organization, which is awesome. It's like yep. fight club for business owners. <laughs> so you put it out there that this, you need this contact. Does anyone know anyone? And so I just got an email intro to one of the directors at um, the M&A firm. And mergers then, and acquisitions yeah, firm mergers in and Brisbane. In Brisbane, yep, on Eagle Street. And they took a look and they were like, yep, this is awesome. And they, so they're like, we don't normally do this. We Because no, they normally deal with really big businesses in it, like agriculture and mining and, build, you know. And we were this beauty company. But the opportunity was so good for them that they, you know, made an exemption for me. And we had an IM, an information mem memorandum, go out just a few weeks later. And I was on my honeymoon and I came back from my honeymoon and... We had like seven investors to choose from. So they know all the high net wealth individuals in Australia. Wow. So the high net worth individuals are on the database of these M&A people. This is all fancy speak for most people who are still thinking about trying to find a product in the back of a Korean supermarket to sell at the market. <laughs> it's just mind blowing, right? Yep. Like it, it blows my mind that literally four or five year journey, you're shuffling through products at the back of a Korean supermarket in Sydney and then four or five years later you're sitting in an M&A firm looking at selling this thing for 10 times its earnings after having travelled to Las Vegas and met you know um, uh, you know the, the US sales people and all this right so they have a database of high net worth individuals looking to buy high growth companies I'm assuming and so they send out the information memorandum like we send out notification that the next podcast is ready yeah <laughs> They're like we've got this little business in brisbane that's this girl this crazy girl that's selling this mascara and it's booming and then you get six or seven investors when you come back and so what's the process then what happens then we i sort of um triage it down to like three or so and meet them and make sure that you know we're i'm happy with who they were and and, and a lot of them their wives use the product like they knew about me and have <laughs> read wow. about me one of them actually came in with the um financial review article so, so he, pr is actually quite yeah. interesting and important because you've got a lot of pr yeah public relations work done so did that helped at that yeah. point yeah. so okay so that you've got it down to three two or three people that have looked at it and looked at the numbers did you have a price on it at this moment or was it like make an offer or how does that sort work? of like i didn't know was like, it a tender i'm not asking you to reveal yeah. the price i'm just asking how does it work yeah uh, I, well, the M and A team put together sort of like this is what it's worth. Indication, yeah. Yeah, based on what I've done to date and future projections and new products coming and the fact that we were diversified in nine sales channels and we weren't just an e-com brand with mm. wholesale. We had uh, contracts with you know Nordstrom, Dillard's, TV shopping. Like we had lots Very of proof. Very sexy package. Yeah, and 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 because it was so global and um, it was easy to ship around. Like it was just ticking all the boxes for them. Uh, and yeah, so that's that's how they came up with the value, and and that's how it all happened. Were you like pinching yourself, just going, "Man, I can't believe I might get a check for this much money." Yeah, I was just like, it happens so quickly. Honestly, well, like that's one of the things I think that's really different about me is I make decisions really fast. Yeah, like I don't have time to think about it too much. I really just go with what feels right. And um, I, I want to talk about handover day in a minute, but so you, you've chosen your winning bidder is that how it worked they sort of said we'll pay this much on these terms is that yep. okay so you've they've you've negotiated terms with your favorite party first mm -hmm. how did what happened on settlement day like what, did you like keep checking your atm or, um like, well we like took screenshots of the bank account and all of that stuff for sure um i think we had dinner we took the team out and it was yeah it was like nothing really changed after that it was like i was still in the business for at least a year and it was all about succession of who's going to take over. And we were really looking to get management in the US because we were sick of going back. Because I did 120 flights in three years. Wow. So it was like we needed to stop doing that. How long did it take before? Because like, a lot of people, they have this fantasy in their head. I'm going to get a check for $10 million, whatever the number is. How, in reality, I've been through this. So I'm asking these questions from a different standpoint. But 
it, 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 it's true, right, that it doesn't actually change that much. It's uh, fleeting. It, it's exciting for it's like... It's a fleeting moment because my life week. didn't... Like I still... Like I lived in sovereign islands in a beautiful canal like home and had a nice car and, you know, got to... Like nothing really changed except for... Um, now it's got new owners and it started to feel like a corporate job again, actually. And you, but you just had a bigger bank balance, but that doesn't inherently make you happier or anything. No. It just maybe makes you sleep a slightly better at night. Yeah. For those who don't know, Sovereign Islands on the Gold Coast, it's like a northern suburbs area. It's just these beautiful islands and the cheapest house in there is probably two or three million dollars today. How, um, yeah. how long and if you did you have to stay on and how long did you yeah. have to stay so on I had for? To, I had to sign an employment agreement. as um, So I actually didn't want to be the CEO. So I actually had a CEO before I sold the company. Uh, I wanted to be creative director. I didn't want to run the company. I've mm -hmm. done the thing. I'm, 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 I've done it. Like, I don't want to be part of every single intricacy of the business. I wanted to be more creative and just work on R&D. And so um, I stayed on to basically put together the product pipeline and um, find the new people in America to kind of head it up. Because as much as they love Aussies in America, they also then want, want to pick up the phone to an American yeah. and like sort out details. And that was part of the deal, right? Yeah. You had to stay on for a period of time yeah. to yeah. get that. So just for you know a anyone listening that doesn't understand mergers and acquisitions, it's usually not the case where you go and you get this big check and then you just leave the next day and you're gone. Thanks and for the cheese. Yeah, <laughs> usually usually you hang around for quite some time and usually it's you know one, two, three years sometimes. Mm, you know, yes. how long were you actually on for? Just for twelve months, 12 and then months. I stayed on my board for another year, and then I had my second child the following year. Yeah. How exciting. I mean, what a great story, yeah. And so um, what did you do after that? So did you just have some time off? And, and, you know, we talked off camera saying, you know, that the pressure now on you is it's a different journey, right? Like because you've had this big hit, you've made a name for yourself. Um, your priorities probably have changed quite a bit since 2016 when you finished. It's now 2024. We've got eight years have passed. You've mm. got different priorities in life. Um, you're doing Mogul Method, which is Mogul Method? Mogul Methods. With yeah. an S, mogulmethods.com.au. Yeah. So today, um, everybody I've spoken to that's dealt with you has just spoken super highly of you. And I think you've got a really good niche and you come from a place of absolute credibility, which is quite rare in the coaching space. Um, you've actually done it, right? You've actually built a retail business from scratch, exited it and cracked the US market. Um, there's not many of you in Australia, so we're very lucky to have you on the pod. And um, are you enjoying running Mogul Methods? Like the testimonials on your website are awesome. The I love women, it. It's just like routinely saying, she's so great to work with. She's such a nice person, but mostly you know the hell you're talking about, you know? So what does Mogul Methods do? Can you tell us yeah. a bit about the Ascension model there? Yeah, so I actually always have been wanting to do what I'm doing right now before I had Cherry Blooms. Like I've always loved helping and teaching. Like I, if I, I could have been a psychologist if I didn't get into business. <laughs> so um, what I do really is help people put a plan together on how to have a commercially viable business and to use the, the business as a vehicle to create wealth because some people don't think about that stuff. Yeah. And I get, give them a reality check like this is hard. And you need to know that you can't just keep putting money into the business and, and not growing an asset or getting anything out of it personally or having a clear line in the sand of when you're actually going to transition out of your corporate job or whatever. Like people are just kind of like flailing about. So I give them a bulletproof plan of what needs to happen um, to get to that next level and, and connect them to people in the US so that they don't have to do what I did, which is, you know, Three years, 120 flights, and all the money I spent in, in flying over there and doing all the trade shows, because I've already built the network. Uh, but for me to open up my network, you need to have, you can't be too premature. So there's a bit of work that needs to be done. So there's a couple of ways I work with brands. But I enjoy that, I love that coaching space, but also it's not just straight coaching, it's also, you know, getting them to what who they need to speak to over there, whether it's 3PL or, you know, new... So new it's the psychology stuff to start with, the plan, the psychology, but then it's the actual... They're actually acquiring your network, mm. which is really, really, really valuable. You know, when you add up what you spent on flights and times and everything to meet Jerry and all these yeah. other people. So can you give us an example of a client? Like, give us an example of one of you... Like, this is, this is my dr ideal client story tell us about somebody that's oh gosh worked. there's so many that's happened but tell us like your stars yeah. like i've got star stories from educating amazon 
people, you know, people like Mark, who've now got a $4 million a year Amazon business. I've got these sort of model stories. You might yeah. have one or two ladies or, or men or whatever that you've helped take their market idea to the US. Have you got anything yeah, you could share? Yeah, so we, I've, I've got one that's um, more than one, but there's, there's one particular brand. They did $50 million during COVID online, mm-hmm. only online. Was this, but were you working with them before that happened? No, but okay. they have no retail presence. They were just okay. online. Okay. And they heard about me and then I got them connected to QVC in America. Mm-hmm. So now they've got their first QVC spot, Q1 this year, live on air. So we got a presenter over there doing it because the, the founders um, injured himself and can't travel to America. But like they've never sold outside of their website. And so the first thing they're d- like they're diversifying now to TV shopping in America, and that was because of my me and my connections. Can, can um, you say the brand? Uh, I don't know if I can, but it's a, a lung breathing device. Okay. Okay. So it wasn't like a super sexy product. Okay. But they they did a really great job online over over COVID. And so you've now got them onto QVC. Yeah. Then I've got an Amazon store that's doing multi millions. It's got a, the conversation starters, you know, the cards. And they've got their first QVC order for Q1 Is that right? this year. Yeah. And then I've got f- other brands who they've never done a trade show. They followed my system and they did 35K in the first three days and broke even in the first few hours wow. because they just followed something that I know works. Mm, that must be hugely rewarding to see. Oh, it, yeah. To see them like get a booking on QVC. So maybe just tell people who don't know what QVC is. It's the, it's the home shopping network in America. So you've got um, 25 million people watching at any one time when you click on the channel wow. and they've got access to 100 million um, households. That's just yeah. like all of Australia at yeah. any one time yeah. watching one and, channel. And you've got to make like 150,000 retail dollars in, in eight minutes or you don't get invited back. So there's really strict... Um, say, say that again. $150,000 worth of, of product in eight minutes. To, to be invited back. Is your, and when is you, your mind ticking right now? Yeah, it's ticking. You know yeah. exactly what I'm talking Jamie, about. Jamie, is your mind ticking over there on the couch? Because yeah. <laughs> Lee's uh, partner, Jamie, has got a product that she wants to launch and, uh, and I'm, I, I invited her here today to listen to you for inspiration, yeah. but I'm sure she's sitting there going, oh my yeah. God, I need to talk to her. It's so funny because when, like, when I think of that shopping network, like TV shopping network, I just think of like a dying business. Oh no. That's something I would not even think of like, ah, uh, no, not interested, you know? And then you start hearing these Being kinds in Australia of numbers. Too, well, right? that, that's Australians, right. Like, like US those is just channels, a different but level, the right? US is like, different. Well, in the 90s, that's what people used to think. It was like, like an infomercial, like it was so daggy. But now, all the brands, if you're a big brand, they want you to be on, uh, on TV shopping because they know that in store, their sales go up 20% because mm. it's free advertising. Totally. Yeah. So I mean, it's, what's, it's what's, a, what's a girl's name on Shark Tank in America? Laurie, isn't it? The yeah, blonde she girl? Started there, yeah. She's a l- little killer like you, yeah. right? You you're actually remind me of that. <laughs> you're like a brunette, Laurie. But Laurie made like mega millions on, on the home shopping network type thing, selling. Like if you, if you want to see a cool product, look up Scrub Daddy, like one of the mm. most successful products that was on Shark Tank era. It's just, and all it is is a sponge that cleans dishes. But the guy's pitch, talk about a highly demonstrable, it's like your eyelashes. It's just such a cool little product. We used to play it at our events to show people. But, it, you know, you don't need a lot of products. And I always say to people, take the time, be objective, be circumspect. Let the market tell you that you have a great product because it is not just hard work. I mean, Jelaine... If you had tried to do it with the wrong product, it's not It's not that it's Jelaine. It is that, but it's also Jelaine plus a great, great product, right? There's a lot of Jelaines out there that are just, and I say to people, you can't win the Melbourne Cup riding a dog. <laughs> it doesn't matter how fast the dog is. You can't win the Melbourne Cup riding a dog. You have to get that bet right because an average jockey on a racehorse is going to beat you. An outstanding jockey like you on a great horse is unstoppable. And so... I think, you know, for everybody listening as entrepreneurs, don't, don't, first of all, don't put Jelaine on a pedestal or any of us on a pedestal because the price of playing is hard work. Everybody's got to work hard. But what Jelaine's done really well as well is be objective about the product and go to the markets and let the market tell you, literally the Brisbane market <laughs> or the Western market, let it literally tell you this is a winning product before you fall in love and sell it to yourself and have your friends and family who don't want to offend you tell you it's great. Let the market tell you. You, you mentioned um, your genius zone before. 
Can you t- can you talk us through a little bit about your genius zone and how you reckon that's been instrumental in, mm. in all the success that Adam's just summarised? Yeah, I think my superpower is just knowing where the trends are going to be. Like, I just have this feel, like I'm an early adopter. Like, things that I thought was were cool and would be big, I was talking about them 10 years ago and it's only now that it's, like, really become mainstream. So I just feel like I've got this um, gut instinct of where, where products are going to be or what the next big trend will be. And, and how, for the people that are watching, how do you advise they tap into their genius zone? Is that something that you work with your clients on as well? Uh, not so much. I think for, uh, it's just really creating space in your, own, in your own self to have that time. Like for me, I, I'm a night owl. So my business, um, like when everyone's like you guys, I think at morning for people, but for me, me at 10 These p.m., guys. 10 p.m., like my mind is just strategy, planning, creative. And I, if I didn't have that time, I don't. Th- I would have just been in my business all that time instead of really looking ahead, planning um, and strategizing. Like I, you need that focus, deep work time. So space, genius zone, find yeah. your genius zone. Do you, do you see yourself getting back into the product space again? Like obviously you're, you look like you're enjoying what you're doing now, but how do you, how do you say no? Yeah, it's interesting. I think if the right product came along, maybe, but I also know what it takes. And I don't know if I'm willing to pay that price again because it's like I've already done it. I really know I don't have to do it again. I really enjoy what I'm doing now. It's more fulfillment for me in terms of helping people. I, I find that's more, more rewarding. And I want to be home more. Like I don't mm. want to be traveling the world for work. I want to be traveling the world because I want to take my family um, overseas and so forth. But I just know what it's going to take because mm. that's at the start, I was very naive of what it would take. I just did it, you know, and didn't negotiate and look back and go, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I did that. But now that I know what it will take, I don't know if I will be willing to do that again. But I will live vicariously through the people I'm helping. We, we might become a client, Eric. <laughs> I'm working on a product right now that we actually might be a, a this, genuine this, client. This whole, this whole pod, I've just been going... <laughs> yeah, yeah, same, same, same. I think, you know, having two young kids, it, that, in that you're in the last years with the 11-year-old of really having her... Oh, her or him? Her, her yeah, both yeah. girls. Yeah, both girls. So having her before she's a teenager and uh, this time is very sacred, I imagine, for you. So I totally, totally get that. And Jelaine, um, it's been an absolute joy, honestly, having you on. I, I've just, I love having any entrepreneur on, but I particularly love having females on that have crushed it because it, it, there's just so few of you um, just just going by the numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think a lot of uh, ladies watching this are going to draw a lot of inspiration that one of their own has not only kept up with the boys but smashed them, you know, um, and done so well. And, and, and in such a classy way, you know, you've, you've done it. You know, the options out there for young people today to make money, um, a lot of them are drawn to the wrong things, you know, and, um, and I think it's just wonderful to see a story of being drawn to the right thing and build real equity and, and learn real lessons and now giving back and adding real value to other Australian, I imagine, other entrepreneurs from around the world. Um, so if you're watching this and Jelaine can be of service to you, if you've got the right kind of business, I imagine there's some sort of qualifying process mm. where they'll either become a client for education, where you'll help them scale a bit more before you can actually work hands on with them. And then there's going to be the next level where you can work with them and actually get them distribution. So go and check out Jelaine. Um, what, where's the best places? Mogulmethods.com.au yeah. and what's maybe your Instagram or what, yeah, where, how can mo- people connect? Mogul Methods on Instagram and mogulmethods.com.au. Yeah. yeah. You can book a call with my wing women or me. Yeah. You might get me, you might get them. And we'll just have a chat. It's 10 minutes and we'll see. <clears throat> yeah, we'll just see if um, we can help you. In most cases, we can. So. I love that. My wing women. What's that? My wing women. My wing women. I love it. Girl power. It's so cool. (laughs) Love it. Um, No, no, I mean that in a totally non-condescending way. We need more female voice in the entrepreneur space. Um, I've always said it at my last company that women actually are better product builders than men are because they're more empathetic. They listen more. They tend to be more objective. Um, so I love that you're doing what you're doing and, and uh, I really genuinely appreciate you coming in today. Thank you so much. Um, we can't wait to see what, what Mogul Methods does next. <laughs> if you have any clients that are crushing it, um, men or women that have taken your advice and scaled um, that the podcast would be of service to them, please recommend them to the show because we'd love to have more people on like you that have legitimately kicked goals in business. So. Um, 
That's it for today. Thank you for being here, guys. Remember, drop a comment below. Let Jelaine know if she has added value to your life. I know you're going to read the comments, right? Just check them out as long as they're nice. If they're nasty, we're going to <laughs> kick you out forever. But drop a nice comment below. Let Jelaine know uh, what, what served you best. Um, and uh, check out our sponsor, Early Bird AI. And most important thing you can do for us guys is subscribe. So by hitting the subscribe button, we can get more quality guests like Jane. They want to come on shows that they know people are watching, right? Mm -hmm. Their time's important. The more people that are watching, the more you share these episodes with your entrepreneurial friends, the more chance of us getting good guests. We don't make any money from the show yet. It's going to be a while. I think we just got monetized on YouTube. Yeah, we did. We a did. A couple of weeks ago. And I just got our first income statement, right? <laughs> it was $22 Yay. for the episode, right? We get $22 from YouTube from ads that they run on our content. So this is definitely not a money-making game. We do it because we love it. So um, please, uh, you know, something like 22 bucks anyway, but share it, with, um, share it with your friends. Drop a comment. And um, thank you for watching. Without you guys, we wouldn't have a show. We greatly appreciate it. And we'll see you all on the next episode of Unemployable. Bye for now. Hey there. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Unemployable. If you'd like to watch another episode, just click there.